appreciate the kind words. I, I, you know, Brother Rick and I like to harass each other, and while we're working together, I, I learned a lot of things too. I learned not to hire people like him uh, for staff. No, that's not true. He he did a good job. Uh, I do want to say this that that uh, as pastor, Brother Brooks, uh, he wants to help you. One of the things that a pastor does is try to help the people to grow in the Lord. And so, and I see that going on here, but I also want to say that at the same time you're growing, God's growing a pastor too. And uh, so I appreciate him. And, and uh, so I, I just, uh, I thank the Lord for the privilege to be here. Uh, I'm so happy about uh, what God's doing here. Great spirit in the services this morning and, and great liberty to preach. Every church doesn't have that, folks. Every, every church. Don't take it for granted. You know, God's doing some things here. And you just rejoice in it. Try to keep your heart right and rejoice in it. But uh, he mentioned, uh, and he, I didn't know anything about him uh, trying to do anything to uh, to pay the building off and that kind of thing. I I pastored uh, uh, Cornerstone, started and pastored it for uh, uh, 24 years, and after about uh, uh, 20 uh, years, I was in this ministry, and I felt like that God would have me to be more involved in this ministry, and I was at the age where I felt like I need to retire and let a, a younger man come in and pastor the church and I could focus on what God had called me to do in missions and so uh, uh, I resigned the church. I was gone for two years. Another fellow, a pastor came in and, and uh, I, I, you know, not, it just didn't go well at all. The church really went through some problems during that time and he resigned. They asked me to come back and pastor them and I said, I'll come back as an interim till you call a pastor. But one of the things we did at the time we came back and God had blessed, we had built a, a new auditorium that seat about 400 people. We owned a, we bought a, a public, a former public school and had campgrounds and, and uh, all of that kind of thing. We had, uh, uh, but we owed, which was not much in comparison to what it was the value at, we owed about $180,000, Brother Rick. And when I came back, I knew that I wasn't going to you know, be the pastor. I'd just be interim. And I came back and I challenged the people uh, about paying the debt off and become a debt free and paying the, uh, everything that we owed off is about $180,000. And I challenged them to do that. And I said, anything, I said, we've got enough in the general fund that we're going to make the payment. We were paid uh, considerably in advance uh, on what we had to pay. But I said, we're going to pay, make the payment out of the general fund and I said, anything that comes in marked for building fund is going to be paid extra on it. I said, let's get the building paid off. And with less than two years, about a year and a half, God paid off $180,000 through those people. Now, I'm just simply saying, I, that may not be the plan that Brother Rick has for you, and that may not be it works here. It might be in, 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 in two weeks. It might be in, in uh, three years. I don't know. I'm just saying this. God will bless you. Uh, for doing that, and so I. Uh, and by the way, when you when you don't have buildings payments, you have a whole lot more to put in the ministry uh, for other things that are more important than buildings. By the way, and so anyway, uh, but I want to tell you just a little bit about the ten forty window. I showed you the DVD, but some things we're uh, different. I know, you know, I know what you, I'm leaving myself wide open. You can say, yeah, y'all really are different, uh, but. Uh, my wife and I, I'm, I'm a retired pastor. I retired from pastoring. And uh, so uh, God put in our heart, I'll probably, if I have time, share some things about uh, the call uh, that God uh, put on my life about the 1040 window. But uh, we, uh, uh, we, give, uh, we go into churches and travel here. And we go to Asia. I go to Asia as often as need be. But we go in churches and we don't ask for anything. We go in and we give churches opportunities. We show the opportunities to be used of God in missions in the light and tenfold window area of the world where two-thirds of the world's population and 90% of the unevangelized of the world lives. And so that's what we do. We don't have, by the way, I, I, I'll be glad to go anywhere and preach and try to help in missions or whatever I can, any way I can. Uh, I don't ask for anything, all right? And, uh, but I, and by the way, I appreciate what you folks do in mission. And you do some things in the 1040 window area of the world. Thank God for that. So I, I want to compliment you for that. But we don't raise 
personal support, monthly support for ourselves. Everything that comes in goes into the ministry to reach those people in the light and the 1040 window ministry. And uh, so we don't raise support for ourselves. Uh, and by the way, uh, uh, I don't know whether I told this or not. I've told so many stories, and I've been here so many times. You folks, this feels like our second home uh, is a church. Uh, we came here for almost a year while our new pastor was getting acclimated uh, there at, uh, at Cornerstone. Uh, but uh, I, I probably told th these stories, but uh, I, w I think it was three years ago, last January, uh, I met a Filipino pastor that we work with, Brother Gil Lorena, you know him, uh, and, uh, in Vietnam. And God had laid on my heart to help start some churches in Vietnam. And so we went to Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City now. Uh, Vietnam uh, Mom is, a, is, is a communist country. And, uh, but Brother Gil Lorena from the Philippines met us there. And uh, we went there and kind of just did a survey trip. Paul and Dee was with us for about three days. And so we got there one afternoon and uh, I, I went to the, we had a hotel already booked and all that kind of thing. And I went to the, uh, went to the uh, uh, exchange, uh, 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 oh, what is it, uh, what's the name, uh, what is it, Brother Paul, what's the name of the exchange people there? They're just money exchange. There's several of them, okay? But there's one. Uh, anyway, where they change, you, they don't take U.S. dollars in Vietnam, okay? You have to change it into their currency. And I'd never been to Vietnam before. I had no idea what kind of currency they use. So I went in to Vietnam, and I took $200 cash because pretty well everything except our meals are going to be paid for. So I uh, uh, was already paid for before I went. And we, uh, so I, I, I exchanged $200 and I exchanged 200 U.S. dollars into Vietnamese dong. That's what they call their currency. They gave me 4.5, four and a half million dong. Uh, and it, uh, the chain is unbelievable. You need a suitcase to carry your money around in Vietnam, okay? Now, I had Brother Rick, I had never even been a millionaire and all of a sudden, I was a multi-millionaire. I had four and a half million dong. And I thought, well, since I'm a multi-millionaire all of a sudden, I ought to go. <coughs> we went out to McDonald's. They had a McDonald's there. And so there was four of us, <coughs> Brother Gill, Paul and Dee, and myself. And I thought, since I'm a multi-millionaire, I ought to buy the meal tonight. We ate at McDonald's, and it cost me two million dong. So needless to say, I left Vietnam broke, all right? Uh, but there's a lot of strange things that happen. I know I've told this, but you got several new people here, so I want you to hear this. This is a very spiritual story. Uh, some of y'all are over 60 years old, so you'll understand what I'm talking. The rest of you, you uh, have been around people that are seniors, so you'll get it, okay? Uh, but there's a lady that lives in uh, uh, Gulfport, Mississippi, Christian lady, she's a sister to a friend of mine that goes to church with us at Cornerstone. <clears throat> and she had a granddaughter that already had children, which would have been her great-grandchildren. And the granddaughter was expecting another child. The grandmother was in her 80s. And so the granddaughter that was going to have the next great-grandchild went to her grandmother and said, Grandma, when this baby is born, I'm not going to let you keep my baby. And the grandma said, well, why not? And she said, well, you're older now, and I'm afraid you might drop my baby. And she said, I'm not going to drop that baby. I may lay it down and forget where I put it, but I ain't going to drop that baby. <laughs> now, some of y'all can identify with that, okay? The rest of you may get to that place, all right? Uh, well, that's enough of that, okay? But we talked about this morning, we're talking about the fact, and I uh, turn, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 6. I'm just going to read a couple of verses there tonight. We read 10 through 18 this morning. And you know, that's uh, about putting on the whole armor of God. But it also lays out the fact uh, that uh, uh, Satan wants to attack 
uh, uh, God's church, God's people. Satan wants us to uh, take our focus off of what God has called us to do. And uh, missions is here in Searcy. It's in all around Arkansas. It's all around the United States. It's all the way around the world. And so uh, that's a priority of God that he gives to us and we are to be a part of that. We co-labor together. Everybody may not physically go to a foreign mission field, but we all work together to get the gospel to those who've never heard. That's the great commission uh, that God gives us. But look, if you will, and we talked about this morning, we talked about uh, that, that on this, to keep our focus, we must first of all have propagation of the gospel. That means we must spread the gospel. We went on and talked about the fact that there, to keep our focus right, we must have Biblical illumination. We need to, people not only need to be saved, they need to be disciple, need to grow in the Lord. And so there must be propagation of the gospel, must be, uh, must be uh, illumination that comes through the learning of the Word of God. And sometimes we think, well, not much I can do. Never underestimate this book is the living Word of God. It is powerful. Now let me tell you something that happened recently. My wife and I, we moved up to Izzard County, Arkansas. I was, re- I was born there, originally from there. Uh, my wife was not born there. She was born down in Mississippi County, Arkansas. But her family was from Izzard County, Arkansas, uh, her mom and dad. Uh, and so we moved up there. Our children were very small. We moved up there, and, and uh, God... Uh, began to call me to preach. I surrendered to preach, and we got in the ministry. I started pastoring, that kind of thing. And and uh, we we believed this. We were taught, and we believe this, that one of the things that we're supposed to do as Christian is is to put the gospel out, to tell people about the Lord. We're supposed to do that. And so we did that. And didn't do all we should, but we did that, okay? And then, so I don't remember when it was. I don't even remember uh, the person. But here a while back, my, my wife, uh, she uh, gets on, I don't do Facebook, she's on Facebook uh, with her, uh, uh, she's got two sisters still living and uh, with some relatives uh, uh, in any way, but, but I don't know how things pop up on Facebook, but somebody said on Facebook, they got on her page or whatever it is and said, uh, are you related to Elvis Sneather? And she thought it was the law looking for me or something, so she hesitated there probably. <laughs> she thought I owed somebody money or something, I'm sure. But she said, yes, I am. He's my husband. And here's what this man said. He said, you probably do not remember me, but when I was a teenager, I lived at Sydney, Arkansas. That's 10 miles away from where we live. And he said, you all come by my house and you told me about Jesus. You shared with me the gospel. And he said, I would not accept Christ as my Savior. But he said, I want you to know something. The Holy Spirit of God never left me alone. He kept dealing with me about the gospel, about being saved. And he said, I'm an adult now. I'm married. I have children. I've been saved. My family's been saved. We're active in a Bible-preaching Baptist church. We're serving the Lord, and I just wanted to say thank you. Now, let me tell you something. I didn't tell you that. I don't even remember it. I don't know the guy's name, don't know where he lived. I just know this, that there was a guy that got witnessed to way back then. Now, he shared the gospel with his family, got his family in church, and they have been saved. My friend, that's what this great commission is all about. And I could tell you about many more, but for the sake of time, we're going to go on. So there must be propagation. There must be illumination. Uh, If we're going to keep our focus, the third thing is there must be something called supplication. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. It says, uh, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Remember I talked about that this morning? The Word of God. The Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and penetrates hearts. That man, the Spirit of God, took the Word of God and penetrated his heart and never left him alone. You never know what a gospel track will do. You never know. 
hand them out. You say, well, boy, I don't, get, I, I don't hear much from gospel. You don't know. Brother Mike Files, pastor of Bible's Baby Shirt, uh, would, he came home one day, a gospel track on his door, and he took it and laid it on the coffee table or the end table, laid it down, did not read it, but about uh, just a week or two later, he had a cousin he was close to that was killed in an automobile crash, and it got his attention and he went home picked up that track and read it and now he's been pastor over the Bible Baptist for several years. See the word of God is powerful. That's what we're broadcasting. That's what we're giving to people. But there must be supplication. Now let's look at verse 18. It says praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. There it uses the word supplication twice in verse 18. In the Bible, the word supplication is used 60 times in the Bible. Let me define what the word supplication means. It means a serious, sincere, humble plea. Now, this thing of supplication is very important. You say, well, preacher, I pray, so do I. But there's a difference just between a simple prayer. Let me say, we'll to pray before we eat food in a restaurant or home. Pray, thank God for the food. But usually that's not supplication. It's prayer, and we ought to be thankful, but it's not supplication. But supplication is sincere, serious prayer. It's Wonderful for us to be saved. It's wonderful to have the Holy Spirit speak to us. But God speaks to us through our Bible study. Do you know that I would, you know how that we started? I don't have any wisdom at all. I can't even get my heart to beat again if it were not for the power of God. What makes yours beat, by the way? Was it your Cheerios that you eat? Did you wind it up? No, sir. It's by the power of God that you have every heartbeat that you have. I have no wisdom, but I was sitting in the airport in Calcutta, India back several years ago. I'm going to brag on God. Not ever seen it, but I want to tell you something. I was sitting there. This was back before things got bad in India and persecution uh, with the Modi administration. I was sitting there reading my Bible, waiting on my flight, and I was sitting there reading my Bible and just... Hundreds and thousands of people going this way and that way and this way and that way. And God began to speak to me. And I knew that the stories about William Carey in Calcutta. In, in the 1800s, the missionaries there. And God began to speak to my heart. These people need the gospel. These people need the gospel. And I began to do research and I found out in, in Bangladesh and in the state of West Bengal, Calcutta, Cap, I found out that there was 264 million people and all of them, their basic language was Bengali. And I said, God, I don't speak Bengali. I don't speak any of these languages over here. I barely do speak English well enough that people can understand me. But I said, God, you're going to have to direct me on this. And I began to pray. God directed me to a man, a national Indian man that I knew in South India. And I thought I remembered him saying something. I knew he's, most of them over there speak six or eight languages if they've got any education at all. And I thought I remembered him saying that he spoke Bengali. I contacted him and I said, I, got, I said, do you speak Bengali? And he said, yes, sir, I, I speak Bengali enough to get by all right. And I said, I want to I ask you to pray about something. I said, I would like to have somebody go to Calcutta with me or meet with me and go to Calcutta and let's just do some survey there. Let's see what's going on there. God has impressed upon my heart to do something in Calcutta. He said, I'll pray about it. He prayed about it for six months and he said, Brother Sneathan, I've got a piece about it. God wants me to go to Calcutta, move my family there. I said, would you meet me up there? He flew to Calcutta, and I flew from wherever I was to Calcutta. We met, 
And I said, what I want to do is I want to go to church this Sunday. We were there. Uh, I got, we got there on Saturday. I said, I want us to go to church uh, on Sunday. And we went to churches. We went to this First Baptist Church on Sunday. And, oh, they probably had 75 people there. There were only 13 million in the city of Calcutta. And they had about 13, uh, uh, about, about uh, uh, 75 people there, something like that. And, uh, and the man preached. Uh, we sat through the services. And the man preached and, and didn't preach the gospel. I'm sorry, but if you're in a, a place that the statistics show that less than one half of one percent profess to know Christ and you have a church there and you don't preach the gospel, why are you there? Why do you have the church? If we're not going to preach the gospel, what's the use of having Liberty Baptist Church? I love the fellowship, but I'm telling you what, we're here for something much greater than this fellowship in one another. And so we went there, wasn't, didn't go to be critical, went to learn. Didn't preach the gospel. Didn't give an invitation. So we had gotten and done the research. We knew what time that church started. That church was out. And we went, and what a, and I please do not understand. William Carey was a great, great missionary. What an honor it was to go to William Carey Memorial Baptist Church in Calcutta, India. We went there. <clears throat> there was probably 150 or 160 people there. They spoke in Bengali. I didn't, the other man understood it. I didn't understand it. By the way, one of the things I learned there, I didn't know this, but William Carey baptized Adoniram Judson and his wife in that church. What an honor. The plaque on the wall. And boy, what, I mean, you know, just, just the honor of being the, in the church that William Carey had started. But the preacher preached. I didn't understand what he did. I noticed that he did not give an invitation. After the services, we went back, got in the cab, and headed back to the hotel. And I said, I got a couple of questions for you. I said, did, any, did the preacher tell anybody about Jesus? He said, no. I said, did he tell anybody that they needed to be saved? He said, no. That's what we found out. God confirmed. I did not know that. I'd heard so much about Calcutta and the missionaries used to go there. But let me tell you something. A lot, it, a lot of things can go the wrong direction in over 100 years. Over 200 years now. A lot of the, and, but it just wasn't there. And I said, okay, let's make a plan. A few weeks later, that man came there. He moved his family up there. God has started 25 churches in Calcutta, India. Now you say, well, preacher, boy, aren't you wise? I have no wisdom except that God give it. God spoke to me about it. God spoke to that man about it. God spoke to a lot of people as they heard the gospel. A lot of people have been saved and 25 churches, house churches are going there. Uh, oh, there, a, uh, a Bible institute with 20 something people are going on. One of them is already passing the church on the Bangladesh border. I'm just simply saying to you, friend, let me say this, that the reason why that happens is because Almighty God speaks to us. Now hang on just a minute. We're talking about supplication. Y'all remember what we're talking about? Let me tell you what. When your preacher preaches the word of God, if you're paying attention, God will speak to you. Because we're preaching a perfect Savior and a perfect Bible to imperfect people. He will speak to us. He will convict us of what we're doing wrong. He will encourage us and motivate us to do right. He will guide us. He'll give us understanding. But he'll speak to you through the Sunday school teacher. He'll speak to you through your uh, Bible prayer, uh, Bible study and prayer and your devotions and your quiet time. By the way, he'll speak to you through hymns. That's the reason why we like hymns and singing that is biblical and, uh, and lifts up the Lord Jesus Christ. He speaks to us through that. And I'll tell you, I've been guilty of this so many times. And it may be in a mission conference that he'd speak to me about helping somebody on the mission field, about increasing my mission giving. It may be about any number of things that he'd speak to me about, about praying more for missionaries, or that kind of thing. But he preached for me. I mean, he would speak to me. And in the invitation, I would just say, Lord, uh, help me to do what you spoke to me about. But I never really prayed with supplication. God, 
help me to give more of myself to your will, whether that be missions, whether that be building fun, whether that be handing out tracts, whether it be teaching a Sunday school class, whether it be working in a children's church ministry, God, take more of me. Let me give more. Seriously praying about that. I'll be honest with you, sometimes, many times, God spoke to my heart. I just said a little quick prayer. The time I got home, I'd forgotten all about it. Y'all know, know what I'm talking about? Somebody say you mean, let me know you're out there. Uh, we've all done that, right? Let me tell you something. God's business is always serious. And when he speaks to, now listen to me. He is speaking to the unsaved about getting saved. But if you're saved, he's speaking to you about his will for your life. The miserable people in the world are not the unsaved people. It's the, God, the people of God, the Christians that have been saved and out of the will of God. Yeah, you know, I, I, honest, I don't always seriously pray about those things and I ask God to forgive me. I want to be more serious about serving Him and I want to challenge you. Seriously pray about what God speaks to you about in this mission emphasis, about all things of this church and what God speaks to you about, by the way, about your family. So many moms and dads are letting their family go to the world because they don't seriously pray. They say something like, well, that's just our world. Everybody's doing that. It doesn't matter what everybody's doing. It matters about what God says we're to do as his people. And so we need not only propagation, not only illumination from the Bible, that there must be supplication, supplication. God works in our heart. We need to respond properly and pray seriously about what God speaks to us about. Now let me get to the next thing here. The next thing is this. We need participation. Participation. That Indian man prayed for about six months about going to Calcutta. He told me God's given me a piece about it. I believe he prayed seriously about it because he's done a very good job in Calcutta. They send me a report every month telling about how many people trust Christ, telling me about how many, what the average attendance is in the house churches, Tell me about how the Bible Institute's going. And I got a text from him about two days ago, three days ago, and rejoicing about what God's doing there. He seriously prayed about it. Now, we need, after we pray and get a peace from God about it, we need participation. The Great Commission, we read about it this morning. Uh, Mark 16, 15 says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every Christian. To, to, excuse me, to every creature, not Christian, but that Christian uh, need the preaching of the word, but they don't need the preaching of the gospel. Uh, uh, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, and so we're to do, that's, God, that's a priority with God. And so, uh, you know, when we think about that, I know how I would. I, I'll be honest with you. <clears throat> I've sure been hard-headed some of the time when God spoke to me. But, you know, uh, the disciples uh, of Jesus, according to Acts 17 and verse 6, uh, the apostles, uh, you know, they, uh, they, they were just common men, some of them fishermen. They wouldn't. They would just made them. They 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 trusted Christ, and they just got serious about serving God, and God used them. The Bible says it was, they were accused of turning the world upside down for Christ. A few men turned the world upside down for Christ. I don't know about our world's pretty much wrong side up right now. Yeah. By the way, we don't need wokeism. We need an awakening of God. That's what we need. And by the way, we don't need socialism. We need scripturalism is what we need. That's what we need. We need some serious prayer. But uh, uh, we need participation. Now, I know how I am. I don't think my flesh is much different than yours. Uh, but I know how I am. I know that if I'm going to serve God, this thing of participation, 
I've told God so many times why I couldn't do what he called me, what he wanted me to do. I've been in mission conferences where that I went forward and said, God, now I know what you laid on my heart, but I don't think I can do that. I don't know how I can do that. Let me tell you how this thing works. Romans 1.17 says the just, that means the saved. If you're saved, you've been justified. You're one of the just tonight, okay? And it says <clears throat> that the just shall live by faith. Now let me go back just a little bit. Some of you may have heard this testimony before me. I know Brother Rick has so many times that he don't want to hear it again, but that don't make no difference. Uh, I'm going to tell it again anyway, okay? But <clears throat> when I was in West Memphis, Arkansas, I got saved, 24 years old. Didn't know much, still don't know much. But I remember that I worked with the youth in, in, at Tabernacle Baptist Church in West Memphis, Arkansas. My wife was a secretary for the church. We were involved. And we moved back up to Izzard County. And God began, that was the country, uh, or the, uh, the county that I was born in. And God began to speak to me about preaching. Now let me tell you something. I did not want to be a preacher. I did not want to be a pastor. I was saved. I wanted to serve the Lord, but I did not want to be a pastor. And what I did is I began to tell God all the reasons why that somebody else would be better. And I still believe there's a lot that would be more qualified in the eyes uh, of anybody uh, other than God but me. But now help me, let me uh, help you understand something here. I don't know if God calls any of you guys to preach or any of you guys to pastor or any of you ladies to teach a ladies class or work with children. Or I don't, I don't know what God's calling you about, but let me tell you this. Whatever it is, God wants you to surrender to it and be willing to do what He wants you to do. And here's the way that works. I said, God, man, I've never been to Bible college. God, I don't know. And I'm not knocking Bible college. I'm, uh, you know, I've, I've learned some things since then, need to learn more. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm glad for folks that have been to Bible college. But I said, God, I, I don't know enough. I don't know how to do that. I don't know. It. And I fought it for two years. And I argued with God for two years. And finally I became so miserable that I said, okay, God, if you want me to preach and pastor, I'll do what you want me to do. I surrendered. Now let me tell you what happened. Before I surrendered, it was this, what I had to do at that time. God had called me. God wouldn't leave me alone about it. I stepped out on faith, having no idea how it was going to work out. But I knew that if it worked out, God was going to have to do it. And when you step out on faith, that's exactly what God wants you to do. God will work through you when you step out on faith. Uh, and I stepped out on faith. I pastored. I love pastoring. God blessed it. I, I have so many good memories of pastoring, and God blessed that. But wait a minute. Now then, <clears throat> after I pastored for 20-something years, actually about 30 years, I had a guy invited me to go to India with him. A guy was pretty well off in, in Florida, a friend of mine, pastor. He had taken him to India, and he was in preaching a meeting for us, and he said, would you like to go, Brother Slade? I, I guess so. I went to India, didn't enjoy the trip. It's a long trip on an airplane. Back then it was 30-something hours to get there, not all, I mean, by the time you get layovers and everything. We landed in Bombay. And this was in 2000. India's made a lot of progress since 2000. Still got a long way to go. But I'm telling you, you better not fly into Bombay, India, because when you step off that plane and the stench of India hits you, open sewers, all that kind of stuff, you'll regurgitate if you don't have a strong stomach. I'm telling you. And I thought, good night. Why in the world did I come over here? Well, we went through customs. We got on a 737, Bowen's 737, and Indian Air, which was horrible back then. And on a flight, about an hour, hour and a half flight to Bangalore. We got up in that air about 30 minutes. Got up there, stood at 11 and off that 
plane started shaking and whistling and all that kind of stuff, and I felt the plane tilt. The guy with me that took me up there, the, the, the plane was packed full of people, and he reached over. He'd been about 13 or 14 times. It's my first trip, and this man reached over. He was a, a layman, a good man. He reached over and grabbed me by the hand and said, Pray, brother. Now, let me tell you something. I knew we need to pray, but I don't like holding hands with a man. And that made me kind of nervous. I thought maybe this thing about this guy, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, he grabbed me by the hand and, and I started praying out loud. Now, there was all kinds of Hindus and a few Muslims and whatever else was on that plane. And they didn't believe in Jesus Christ like I did. But they didn't mind me playing, praying because they were scared too. Got that plane turned around, came back into Bombay and landed. We lost the engine on that plane. Now we go back through security again and they put, on a, put us on another one just like it. But you know what? I went to India. I stayed in India 15 days. I told my wife, I, did, I, I love seeing people get saved. I love what happened. I told my wife from India about two days before I came back, I said, I'm not ever coming back over here again. I got home. And just a few days after I got home, man, I'm telling you, when I got back, I think I landed in Chicago first and I got back, and I, I know I'm not supposed to act like an idiot, but I almost got Pentecostal when I touched American soil. When I pulled in to Mount Pleasant, Arkansas, nobody in the car but me, I'm telling you, I was shouting, having a good time. I'm telling you, Israel County, Arkansas was a wonderful place. I was so glad to be back. Went back to the church that I was pastoring, Cornerstone Baptist Church. People would say, Brother Saint, how is your trip? I'd begin to weep. Couldn't because God had put in my heart those people. I fought it for two years. After two years, here's what happened. I finally became so miserable. Tommy Tillman, a great missionary to, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, oh, good, Mongolia and uh, to Thailand and worked with uh, uh, lepers in Thailand, was preaching in a meeting and, <clears throat> and I, he preached and it seemed like that, uh, the, the, the building was full of people and it seemed like everything that he preached was right to me. And when he got finished pre preaching and gave the invitation, I went forward and I got on my knees. Uh, the altars were full. I got on uh, the front pew there, bowed down, put my, my head down in the chair. And I said, God, if you want me to resign the church and go to Asia and start serving you over there, I'll do what you want me to do. And just instantly, God gave me peace and God spoke to me. Now, I'm not talking God didn't speak to me audibly or anything like that. But God said to me, and Rick knows this. Brother Rick knows it. I don't mean to be disrespectful. Your pastor, Rick, knows this. But most of the time, probably 85% of the time that I pastored, I had a business and made my living. I operated that business and I pastored the church. I'm not sure recommending everybody to do that. You do how God leads you, but that's the way God led me. And God said to me, I'm not wanting you to resign the church. I have trained you to balance more than one thing. You go back and talk to the church and tell them what I want you to do. I went back and we had men's meeting in our church and, and then we brought it, uh, told the whole church after that, but anyway, we had men's meeting. I went to the men's meeting and I said, fellas, let me tell you what God has done in my heart. I said, I'm rational with this thing. But I said, I have got to be involved in a ministry over in Asia. I've got to be involved in it. God won't leave me alone. I've surrendered to do that. And uh, that's what i got to do. Now, I don't want to leave the church. I want to be your pastor if you want me to, but I've got to do that ministry also. And they said, Pastor, you work through the assistant pastors, and you remain our pastor and you be gone as often as you need to over there. You do what God has called you to do. It's amazing what God can work out when you take that step of faith to do what God's calling you to do. 
and God will do great things. Thousands of people have been saved in Asia. Hey, I appreciate every ministry over there, every ministry anywhere that preaches the gospel and the word of God. But let me tell you something. Through the light and the 1040 window ministry and what God has allowed us to be a part of, literally thousands of people have come to know Christ and hundreds of churches have been planted over there. Now let me just simply say, I want to get, uh, the, the, the gentleman back here asked me this morning. Now the title of your message was Keep Your Focus and what was that other part about a fork? Our focus, we need to keep our focus on the Great Commission. It was keep your focus and keep your fork. We had a fellow that taught our Bible Institute at Cornerstone when I was pastor up there several years ago. His name was Brother Barry. And uh, Brother Barry was an excellent, he had been a school teacher uh, before he surrendered his life to Christ. And he was an excellent teacher. He had uh, uh, a college degree. He, had, uh, he went to Bible college, all that kind of... He was an excellent preacher and teacher. He handled our Bible, college, uh, our Bible Institute, and he was, uh, uh, worked on staff part-time with us the last three years of his life, and then he had a heart attack, and the Lord took him home. But he, uh, he preached a message one time uh, at our church, and he came in and... and uh, he had a plastic fork in his pocket when he went to the pulpit. And I thought, well, good night. Did Brother Barry forget to eat supper or something, you know? It was on a Sunday night. I thought, what in the world is he doing with a plastic fork? And he got up there and he announced the title of the message. He said, I'm going to preach to you on the subject of keep your fork. The best is yet to come. And he gave this illustration. He said, when I was growing up, he said, my dad had a sister. Her name was Bessie. And he said Aunt Bessie would oftentimes invite us to her house for Sunday dinner. Now, those of you that call it lunch and the evening meal dinner, that ain't the way it is. If you're from Arkansas, the evening meal's supper, amen? The noon meal is dinner, all right? My wife is very biblical. She said the Bible doesn't say anything about the marriage dinner of the lamb. <laughs> we won't split hairs over that, okay? So if you use the dinner, that's all right. But he said they would, she would invite us for the noon meal, dinner, what we called it, uh, and said, boy, my Aunt Bessie was a great cook. And said we would go over there for dinner, and said, boy, she would bring out that fried chicken. Said she'd bring out that mashed potatoes and gravy and those fresh uh, raised vegetables and stuff that she'd cooked. And said, man, those homemade rolls, she'd bring that out. And he said, man, we'd just have a feast. And he said, we'd enjoy that so much. And said, then she'd come around. And she'd walk by and she'd reach down and pick up our empty plate. And she'd say, now keep your fork. The best is yet to come. And he said we knew what she meant. We knew that there was going to be blackberry cobbler or we knew that there was going to be uh, coconut pie. I said she could cook, she could bake, she could do all those things. We knew that it was going to be apple pie and ice cream. We knew the best was yet to come. And he said, folks, let me tell you something. This thing of serving the Lord, the best is yet to come. Most of you are familiar with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 through 18. Let's turn there just a minute, and I want to close in just a minute here. Well, not a minute, but close to a minute, a few minutes. When I get through or when Brother, uh, when Brother Rick turns out the lights, hey, whatever, we'll, we'll... 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, look at it. Now, speaking to the believers, the saved, I hope you're saved tonight. If you're not, God wants to save you. But speaking the same, here's what it says. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, or those that are dead, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Now let me just simply say this. Whatever a person's faith is in for eternal salvation and eternal life in heaven, other than Jesus Christ, God's word says you have no hope. No hope. He said, so they have no hope. Look at verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also 
which sleep in Jesus, the dead in Christ, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not present, uh, prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Let me say something to you. Not only is there going to need to be propagation, not only does there need to be illumination, not only does there need to be supplication, not only does there need to be participation for us to keep our focus, but there also needs to be celebration. Celebration. My friend, let me tell you something. According to 2 Corinthians 5, 8, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Philippians 1.23, Paul says, which is far better. Let me tell you something. <laughs> I like pie, unless Miss Karen cooks it. Uh, <laughs> she, she played a trick on me one time and made a chocolate pie. It looked so good. They invited us over for supper. They'll do anything just to make, play a mean trick on you. And she put hot sauce and sauerkraut and mustard in that pie. So I don't like her pie. I don't even like her anymore, okay? <laughs> but I'm telling you, I know it don't show on me. How many of y'all like a good, home-baked, fresh coconut pie? How many like? How many of y'all like a good, fresh, home-baked chocolate pie? How about an apple cobbler, a cherry cobbler, a blackberry cobbler? I like, how many of y'all getting hungry? Okay, now listen to me. The best food that you've ever had, the best meal that you've ever had, the greatest time you ever had, ain't nothing like what's waiting for us because here in the scripture it tells those that are saved that there's going to be in the future, it may not be far away, first of all, a resurrection, the dead in Christ. Their bodies are going to come out of the grave. The dead in Christ is going to be a resurrection. Then there's going to be a rapture. We're going to be caught up together with them in the air. And then there's going to be a reunion. I'm going to see my mom and dad. I'm going to see my granddad. I'm going to see my grandmother. I'm going to see my sister. I'm going to see my brother. I'm going to see all of those people, Brother Rick, that we had the privilege of pastoring over the years, all those people that serve the Lord together with us. I'm going to, there's going to be a hallelujah time. We ain't never seen nothing like it. The best is yet to come. So while we're here, Let's try to sign up as many as we can to go where go, they're go, we're going. Let me say this. Every person in Asia, every person in Africa, every person in America, every person in the world needs to hear the gospel. You and I are privileged people. Privileged people. I've got to tell you one more illustration. I'm just having such a good time. I've got to tell you one more illustration. That first trip I went to India, we had an eight-night meeting in an open field, about 1,000 people showing up a night. And after I got back home, a month or so later, I got a letter from the Indian National Missionary that I work with over there. And he said, Brother Sneed, I want to share this letter that I got from a man in Dondali. That's the place, the city where that we had that meeting. And this man said, wrote to Brother Isaac, the national, and said, Brother Isaac, I attended the meeting in Dondalee. Somebody invited me, and I went to the meeting. And he said, I'm a Muslim, or was a Muslim. And he said, I went to the meeting, and he said, what the preacher, which was me, said what he, ma uh, what he said made me angry. And he said, I went home and said, I didn't like what that preacher said, but he said, for some reason, I went back the next night. And he said he made me angry again with what he said. Now, here was what I was preaching. I was preaching the blood of Jesus Christ and nothing but the blood for salvation. 
You need to repent and confess that you're a sinner in need of a Savior and turn from your wrong beliefs and put your faith in Christ. That's what I preach. And it made him mad. And he said, I went back the next night. He said, I got mad every night. said, finally, the last night, he said, I went home that last night and he said, I said, I'm glad the meeting's over. I wish I'd have never gone. But he said, Brother Isaac, every night something wouldn't leave me alone. He said, I couldn't sleep. He said, I was so troubled inside. He said, I couldn't sleep. He said, I got so miserable. He said, I got down on my knees and I called upon Jesus. That man that the preacher talked about and I put my faith in him and he said Jesus come into my heart I have peace he said I'm no longer a Muslim I'm a born again child of God listen to me listen to me everybody needs that I don't remember the man I probably never met the man probably there's a thousand people there but one of these days I'll see that man in heaven that will rejoice because somebody shared the gospel with me and I had the privilege of sharing the gospel with him but Jesus saved me and saved him we're going to rejoice and the best thing about what's coming is that we're going to see the one who died for us, saved us, and loves us, gives us peace, and gives us purpose in life. That's what mission is about. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Don't know your heart tonight. You may be here tonight if you've never been saved. Maybe you've gone and got baptized or whatever. Baptism is a great thing, but it doesn't save anybody. If your faith is in anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to put your faith in Him and Him alone to save you. If God's spoken to your heart tonight about something in this mission conference, it may be about uh, taking some responsibility, about serving something, about handing out tracts. It may be about any number of things. It may be about uh, uh, doing more in the mission program as far as your giving. Some of you may be here and maybe you don't even practice biblical tithing yet. Let me say that God's shovel is bigger than yours. And that's what Luke 6.38 teaches. Give and it shall be given to you. Press down, overflowing. God will bless you if you obey Him and trust Him. But if God has spoken to your heart about anything, the invitation is for you. We invite you to come. I'm going to pray and then we'll stand together. Let's stand together as we pray and then you come as God speaks to you. If you just need to come and pray, give some serious prayer to what God speaks to you about. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would just bless this invitation. Thank you for these dear people and the privilege that I've had to be here. Thank you for what they're already doing. But God, you want all of us, not just a little part. You want all of us. Give the faith to each of us to take that step out on faith to accomplish what you deal with us about and just see how you will provide and how you will bless God, help us to do our part to get the gospel here, there, and everywhere so that everybody might have the precious promises that we enjoy. Bless this invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.